It is Wednesday afternoon, January 18th. We will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 15. We'll start word by word, verse by verse, with verse 12, but we'll back up with just a few of the verses to understand the context of where we are. But just before I begin that, during the last uh, class, I mentioned the pigeon. Don't ask me why. Oh, I know why. Duh. Because we're talking about the birds in this in this vision here, this, um, yeah, I can't sure. call it a vision, but you know, this situation oh. here. And it made me reference a pigeon. Now, I did not, honestly, I failed to remember until just this very moment that I was supposed to look up unclean and clean in regard to the pigeon. <laughs> Sorry, that'll be part two. But I did say there was a, a good little <laughs> devotional on the pigeon that I wanted to bring to you. So that's what I remembered. And when you have time, go read Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. It's not that he talks about the pigeon, but verse 10 says, he, meaning Daniel, knelt down on his knees three times a day, prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom. Three times a day that he stopped and took time, those are the three prayer times, in Judaism, they'll, they'll usually last even about an hour each time that they just, everything stops and they spend that time in prayer with God. So that was Daniel's habit, and those verses that I told you to read will give you a good uh, insight into his life, and he definitely was known as a man of... Prayer, um, purpose, and prosperity. Very good. Doris still remembers years later, a man of prayer purpose and prophecy and yes give her the kudos give her the crown yay <laughs> and that's daniel 6 10 1 through 10 read 1 through oh, 10 1 through 10 yes oh. yeah but have you ever wondered why the pigeon walks so funny oh, it's so yeah, he can pigeon. see where he's going a pigeon can't focus his eyes as he moves so the bird actually has to bring his head to complete stop between steps in order to refocus so that's what you see. He proceeds clumsily, head forward, stop, head back, stop, and he can see and he takes his next step. That's what this poor little pigeon is doing with every step. That's what I should have done this morning. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, because we didn't start recording, one of our class members took a fall today. Thankfully, it was not serious. She's, she's got aches and pains, but nothing broken. But she just blurted out, that's what I should have done this morning, because she tripped over a parking stub stop thingy that she couldn't see or didn't see. So she feels like a pigeon right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> she wishes she was. She thinks she would have recovered better. <laughs> and don't, this is Maria. Don't feel that I did that maybe 10, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Every, I, did exactly I know thing. so many people who have done it. We've all probably well, at yeah. least tripped, if not gone down from oh. it. Yes. But the reason for bringing it up is in our spiritual walk with the Lord, we have the same problem the pigeon has. We don't have clear focus. We're clumsy. We're clumsy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and if we would stop and refocus with the Lord instead of plowing forward, how much would we save ourselves in agony, in pain, in, in at least an hour? <laughs> but as we learn to walk with the Lord, we will walk better. We do know that. I don't know if the pigeon ever gets to walk better, but it was Daniel learning to dedicate three different times of his day to an hour of prayer to really keep that focus. And so that's what I wanted to bring out. Um, we look at the pigeon and we say, what a funny walk. Look at the funny bird. Well, you know what? I'd rather look funny on the outside and to have that ability to see well and navigate well on the inside because I'm stopping and refocusing instead of just plowing on and come what happens. So there's the, the pigeon walk um, devotional that I referred to. There's more, but that's it in a nutshell. Um, and again, next week, if I can remember, I'll get you whether the pigeon was clean or unclean. But anytime, if it is a pigeon, if that's what our Hebrew tells us and it's been used in sacrifices, then it was a clean because they didn't use unclean. Yeah, I didn't think so. so. No.
No. Okay, so back in our bear sheet, in our Genesis, the reason why pigeons came up is because we have this episode happening where God has told Abraham that he is going to have a seed from his own loins, that it's not going to be Eliezer, it's not going to be from Hagar, it's going to be through Abraham, and we know that connects with Sarah, Sarah, Sarai at this point. Anyway, um, he was asking God how he could know, because his body's as good as dead, so is hers, How's this going to happen? And it wasn't being asked as a lack of faith. I don't believe. Some do, but I don't. I think it was more the same way that Mary, Aunt Mary asked the angel when she was being told that she was going to be the mother and give birth to the Messiah. She said, how can this be when I don't know a man? Excuse me. Avram, was, Avram, sorry, he's still Avram. I'm studying ahead, sorry. <laughs> he was just questioning, how can this be? in the right way, not in the wrong way. Um, he had nothing to prove it. He didn't have even a deed that says his land is going to be yours. He doesn't have the child to pass it on to. He's overwhelmed, but remember, he's just come out of that great moment of faith. It's not far from that time when he was declared righteous according to his faith. Yes, we are going to see the ups and downs in these next chapters. We see Avram on track. We see him make mistakes, back on track, make a mistake. I'm not saying he wasn't human, but I just don't see it here. And especially because God didn't take him to task. God didn't say, <coughs> why aren't you trusting me? No, instead he said, okay, go get, and he named the animals, the, uh, the three-year-old female, oh, heifer started, the heifer, the female goat, the ram, the turtle dove, and the young pigeon. And he divided the animals in half, except for the birds. He put one on each side. There was a pathway in between. And last week we looked at um, the fact that covenants during even your Miz day, which comes later, were still using this mode as making a covenant between two people. They would walk through the carcasses of these animals and in essence be declaring, if either of us break this covenant with the other, then we should be like these animals. It should, it should be our death. So it was a way of, of uh, symbolically expressing what was taking place. We have things that came along the line later. We have the handshake that at one point was a declaration, but at this time, this is what we are looking at. We see that after Avram lined up these animals, that, that he brought them to God, he cut them in half, he lined them up. I'm going through the verses between 7 or 8 and 11. In 11, we saw birds of prey. That would be like your vultures, your crows, ravens. That would not be the clean um, animals or the, the little doves and that sort. They come and they try to, to get the carcasses because that's what they do. They eat the meat off of carcasses. Yes, Dora? Uh, does these animals have like a significance in... The significance that we looked at last week, their age showed that they were um, in the prime of life. Females showed ability to bring life. You know, we saw some of the different meanings last week. Um, we know that these animals are what are used in the sacrificial system that will be given to them. It's not there yet. But it will be, we saw that it could represent easily the life of Messiah from his being in his prime when he went into ministry, his being able to bring life and he for him out of death, all of that. So that's pretty much the symbolism that we saw last week. A little more in depth last week, but that's it. You know. And thank you for that. So any others who did not hear would be on that same page. Um, so then we saw that, that after Avram tried to drive these vultures away and keep them from destroying the scene, he goes into a deep sleep. We talked last week about how that's a picture of death, that uh, Avram is going to receive his inheritance, what God has promised him, but not in his natural life. He is as good as dead. Sarah is also, and it's still going to be time before they do receive this promised seed. And when we get to Hebrews, a good Jewish book telling us about our Jewish forefathers, chapter 11 and verse 13 says that Abraham was as good as dead in the ability to reproduce. So when Abraham is revived from this deep sleep, it's a picture of resurrection life. 
it, we first have the death, then we come into the glory. And that's a picture for us of Yeshua, who gave his life and yet came back to life, resurrected life, and promises us the abundance of that resurrected life, that kind of power in our lives today and that kind of eternality living with him forever in heaven. So we definitely can see it being a picture of Yeshua. We also talked about how the sleep would picture the time. It's going to be a long time that they were going to be in tribulation in Egypt. We looked at the fact it's going to be 400 years. Then his seed would inherit the promised land. And when we look at the 400 years in relation here in Genesis 15, we see that it, that equals four generations. So at this time in scripture, a generation is about 100 years, and we're talking about great, great, grand child to get down to that fourth generation that's going to inherit the promises that Abraham's getting told about now. So that also the picture for the deep sleep, the long sleep. It was a horror, it was a terror to Abraham. Darkness in scripture often is a picture of judgment. We saw that last week also. We talked about at the crucifixion when the, the whole sky became very dark while Yeshua was on the cross. We saw that in the coming tribulation time, Revelation 16, the fifth bowl, is a time of such darkness on this earth that men are going to gnaw on their own tongues in the pain of that darkness. We saw earlier than that, if I take you back to the time of Egypt, back to the children of Israel in Egypt before that fourth generation um, has happened and they get to go to the promised land, we see that uh, plagues were brought against Egypt. Each one, they said the severity was getting worse and worse. The ninth out of the ten was the plague of darkness again. And again, it's a picture of affliction, a picture of the tribulation, what would come on Abram's posterity for 400 years. So the, the darkness is there for that purpose, to show that. It was an oppression, it was an affliction, and those are the same words used for what our people were going through in Egypt. Um, you can read about it in Shemot in Exodus chapter 1. You also will see in Exodus chapter 12 the 400 years reference. It also specifically says in Scripture that they were 430 years. And last week we looked at the difference. It could be the start time that they're looking at, the view that they're looking at, or it could be a general, as we would say, it's seven years, but it might have been six years and 11 months, or it might have been seven years and two months, but we're all talking about the same thing in general. When you talk about hundreds of years, the 30 isn't enough to say, oh, they're, they're disagreeing with each other. No. They're either looking at a different start point or they're talking in general terms, either way. Um, I think I also gave you some, uh, no, I didn't. I don't think I did give you. Um, verses 13 through 16, um, and I think we did read 12 last week, so sorry, I'm picking up with 13. In these next verses, we have a prophecy of the Egyptian bondage. We're going to see seven points to that that is being foretold. Remember, we have the privilege of looking back. Avram knew nothing about a coming uh, time of slavery in Egypt, but in this, we're going to see the picture of it. So when we look at verse 13, it says, Now when, I'm um, sorry, we did, yeah, 12 we've done. The sun was going down, deep sleep fell on Avram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Verse 13, God said to Avram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that's not theirs. Now he's just promised his descendants a land. So it's not going to happen in the land he's promised them. They're going to be sojourners. They're going to be strangers in a land not theirs. Uh, where they will be in, well, okay, before I read the next phrase. We see here in verse 13, run with me over real quickly to Genesis chapter 46. And we're going to read in, in Genesis and Bereshit 46. We're going to read uh, verses 2 to 4. Genesis 46, verses 2 to 4. And there we read, God spoke to Israel, that's Jacob, Yaakov, in visions of the night and said, Yaakov, Yaakov. And he said, here am I. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. 
Okay, so he often is being told you're going to, your descendants are going to be strangers in a land not theirs. Now, in between the time of this in chapter 46, they're in Israel. Jacob's being told by God, don't be afraid to go down into Egypt. I'm going to be with you there and I'll make you a great nation down in Egypt. Now, we can fast forward and say, wow, that is what happens because we know that Jacob goes down into Egypt for food when Joseph is on the throne and we know that by the time they come out of Egypt and it's many years after from the time of Jacob to the time they come out they're going to go from being 70 people approximately to more than two and a half million people God made them a great nation while they were down in Egypt yeah but this wow. was like 30 years from what uh, God told Abram the now yes Yes, yeah, um, longer than that, okay. longer than that, yeah. It's not our 30 years start point difference, but it's longer than that because you're going to get through Isaac's life, Jacob's life, you know. To, um, well, mm -hmm. Jacob's going to be, oh, how old is he when he goes down into Egypt? J Joseph is 17 and then he's 30. I'm trying to remember when he was born. Let me peek. I've got something here that's going to tell me. <laughs> Because um, I remember we look into years. Okay, Abram was. Okay, I don't want to confuse you. Let's just say Jacob is um, goes down into Egypt at about a hundred and thirty years of age. Oh my goodness! Yeah. yeah, yeah. He goes looking for his wife when he's about sixty, so he's not a, a spring chicken <laughs> like you think. But we'll come to all of that very very shortly. Give me another couple of um, explanations and we'll be into that. So it's a number of years, yeah. um, but, but there is your difference, yes. Yeah. Now, verse 13 in chapter 15, where we're studying, if I let us read it, and you can go back and look at it, I'll go back there in a moment, it said that they would go down into a land that's not there, sojourn there, and they would become servants there. Well, you're going back and looking. I'm going to go on into Exodus and show you that that's exactly what happened. They became servants there. Exodus chapter 7, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 1, verses 7 through 14 is what you want to write down. I won't read that all now. But verse 7 says, But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty. That's your nation that God said, you'll become a whole nation outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. So that the land was filled with them. Now a new king or a new pharaoh rose over Egypt who did not know Yosef. He said to his people, behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them or else they will multiply. And in the event of war, they will join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. They'll kick us out of our own land. So they appointed taskmasters. Here's the key verse, verse 11. I did read it all to you. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Okay, they became Egypt's slaves. How long was this going to happen? Back in verse 13, it tells you they were to be afflicted 400 years. Jump with me if you want or just listen. I'm going to Exodus 12 and verse 40. And Exodus 12, Shemot chapter 12, verse 40, it says to us, okay, if I can get my tablet to go down that far. Now, the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. So you've got your 400 and that little bit more depending on which view you are looking at. Now, I'm going to take us back to um, Genesis, 13, Genesis 15, verse 14 now. Um, but it, well, let me just take you back there. I don't want to confuse you. I go back to where we've been, Genesis. where we started. Genesis 15. 15. There we go. Genesis 15. We've done all of verse 13 now. They were descendants in a land that's not theirs. They'd be enslaved. They'd be oppressed for 100 years. 14 says, But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. Did God judge Egypt? Yes, the plagues came on Egypt. The final 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, made Pharaoh finally say they could go. But those plagues were judgments on the nation. And did they come out with great 
uh, possessions, with many possessions. <coughs> yes, they did. If you're jumping back and forth, go back to Shemot, Exodus chapter 12, and this time we're going to go down to verses uh, 35 and 36. And I, I love this. This is my God. <laughs> yes. And what do you think that with Israel, as big as they were growing, you're worried about them taking over you later. Wouldn't it be nice to be nice to them, give them food and water, get them what they need to build things with, instead of making it harder and harder for them, you know? Make them to, like you? Yeah, make it just the opposite of what they were trying you, to do. You can gather more bees with honey and vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it, but they felt threatened, they felt scared, and what does a bully do when he feels threatened and scared? You know, yeah, he acts it. like a bully. Yeah. You know, whether it's wise or not. So, yeah, it, it would have been wiser to let, let's make allies, let's be friends, let's support like each sure. other. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe they didn't because um, Israel, excuse me, they were involved in being shepherds and that was anathema to the Egypt. Uh, it might have been the language barrier kept them from, you know, making nice with them. <laughs> Fear will make people do strange things and make them try to subdue others and I would say fear was a great motivator but yeah go ahead good question good question can't talk okay so Exodus 12 35 <laughs> and 36 says now the sons of Israel had done according to the words of Moshe for they Moses for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver articles of gold and clothing and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Here's your favor, Roger. <laughs> so that they let them have the request. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. Wow. They came out of Egypt with all of Egypt's silver and gold and clothing. <laughs> they did plunder. And you might say, well, is that fair? Well, you know what I think God said? You children of Israel have served, have been slaves for 400 years. You've not received a paycheck, not what you've deserved. You've been exploited. So I'm going to give you everything you deserved, all your back pay, and I'm going to give it to you all at once. I'll give it to you in the means of gold, silver, and clothing, and what you need now as you go out into your new life. Look also at Psalm 105, 37. That this is our God. You may feel like things are not just and fair and right, and in this world they are not, but when God's done and he's had his final word, yeah, justice is served. Mm -hmm. Psalm 105 in verse 37. Mm -hmm. Then he brought them out with silver and gold, and among his tribes there was not one who stumbled. So <laughs> they came out with a lot, and they didn't trip over the parking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they were able to, to begin on their way. Um, when it says they came out with great substance, if you have that in your English, it means movable property, many possessions. If it wasn't nailed to the ground, they were able to move with it. Yes, Maria. She's got that question. She's, yeah. We're still not hearing you. There you go. Okay. Yeah. You know, when you say <clears throat> about, uh, you know, taking all the money from them, but that, the, the Egyptians did it willingly because yeah. the Lord caused them to do that. Yes, yes, absolutely. They did not steal. They did not mm -hmm. lord it over them and threaten them. No, thank you. No, they, they gladly gave. In fact, I think if I kept reading in Psalms, I think it said Egypt was glad. Uh, it might right. say that and, and the reason why, because they 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 became like uh, fearful of them, right. so they that they much. wanted they wanted to get rid of them. So let them yeah go and let's help money. you on your way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. Don't want you coming back because you can't make it go. <laughs> yes, but it was God at work. Absolutely. Yes. Good point. Okay. So. Going back, we see um, who this would happen to in Genesis 15. Uh, I think I'm in verse 14. I'll tell you in just a second. And we're back to Genesis. Yes, we're back to Genesis, but we're going to go to Genesis chapter 25 if you want to look ahead. Put your finger in there. 25. Um, 25 is where we're going. But right now, back in Genesis 15, verse 15, okay, is where we are. 
As for you, Avra, you shall go to your fathers in shalom, in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. So what God just said in that verse is, Avram, you're not going to suffer through this. You're not going to go into slavery. You're not going to see the coming out of slavery with all the possessions. That's going to happen long after you've died. You're going to have a good life. You're going to live to a good old age. You're going to be buried with your fathers. And that's just an expression, you know, a family burial. Not that you got buried somewhere that you didn't belong because that happened to be where you died. So now look at Genesis 25, verses 7 and 8. And Genesis 25, 7 and 8 says, These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Now remember, he's, he's not had Ishmael yet, so he's, not, he's about 85. Because I think he's going to have, or has he had Ishmael? No, he has not yet. He has Ishmael at 86, and, and we're prior to Ishmael. So, are we not? <laughs> I'm so, uh, because I'm studying ahead and behind. Anyway, he's around 85 right now, and where, we're, where he's having this uh, time with God. And he's being told he's going to live a ripe old age, and Genesis 25 tells us that's 175. So he's going to live about 90 more years. That's a long time. And he is going to die in peace in, in where he is. Verse 8, Abraham breathed his last, died in a ripe old age, an old man, and satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. So his end is good, okay? Then God says again, it's your descendants who will return in our fourth generation. That's Genesis 15 again, and that is verse 16. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Before we get that second phrase, hear what God is saying again is in the fourth generation you're going to return. Actually, since we're going to look at those generations here for a moment, let me tell you when it says the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. When the iniquity, when the cup is full, that's when God's judgment is meted out in fullness. He doesn't prejudge. He doesn't go halfway, he waits. The same way that we know he's waiting right now for the judgment of the tribulation to fall on this earth, we know it's getting bad. We know evil is filling that cup. We know that it seems to us that their thoughts are only evil continually. The only way I can say we're not equal to Noah is we have more than eight people who do believe in the Lord and who are serving the Lord. But other than that, my world around me, I think, is as evil as the day of Noah. And God did bring judgment. God will bring judgment again. He will bring judgment against the Amorites when they have fully, when it's, that's it. And God just says, enough is enough. So that's what he means by that. So now let's look at that fourth generation. And basing it again, on, it's, it's about 100 years because of what we see. Now go with me again to Shmo, to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, we're going to start with verse 16, and I think if you're looking, it might be easier for you to follow. Um, I've got my notes, so hopefully I don't confuse you. Okay, these are the names of the sons of Levi, Levi according to their generations. Gershon and Kohath and Merari, and the length of Levi's life was 137. Then the sons of Gershon are Libni Shmai, according to their families. The sons of Kohath, Amram and Izar, and Hebron and Uziel. The length of Kohath's life was 130 years. Then the sons of Merai, Mali and Mushi. These are the families of the Levites, according to their generations. Verse 20, Amram married his father's sister, Yachabad, Bad Yachabad. That's a hard one. And she bore him Aharon, Aaron, and Moshe, Moses. And the length of Amram's life was 137 years. Okay, I, for any of these people who are alive in heaven today and I just slaughtered their names, God forgive me. <laughs> but my point is, we see generation after generation after generation. We see a fourth generation when we get to the familiar name of Moses. We know Moses is the one who brings them out of Egypt. So we know we're looking at the four generations. We're looking at about 400 years, and we're looking at the time that, that God said, in your fourth generation, your family, your descendants, will come back out of Egypt. Now, 
Go with me to Galatians 3.17. Don't forget this. We're coming back to this. But go with me real quick to Galatians 3 and verse 17. In Galatians 3.17, we read, What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, there's your 30 again, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. Okay, we're right now in the middle of that covenant. We're in the middle of being told God's making a covenant with Avram. If you don't remember that, that's what started and what that we began to talk about in class last week. With the, the covenant, with the animals, you know, divided, with um, the path in between. We haven't completed this, but this is God making a covenant with Avram. This covenant is going to be called the covenant of promise. God's promising. This is what God promises to do. As we go through the next verses, you will see that. You'll, you'll come to understand that fully if you don't already. Now, when we move down the line, we do get to the time when they come out of Egypt 430 years after God told Abram that they were going to be 400 years in captivity. And we have the law. Moses brings the law. Go ahead. The law. Oh, Lot. Lot. Oh, I thought you said Lot. Oh, no, no. Lot is his, his nephew, but no. Yeah. God brings law there under law. They have to keep law for salvation. Law. Right now they're going to be under a promise. They're going to, to adhere to the promise of God and their relation to it will show their faith and they'll be saved by promise. Okay, okay. but it's going to soon move, well, 430 years later, it's going to move into Lot. Oh, yes. Okay, so who is he talking to? And is this after the law has come into place? Yes. In Galatians is Paul talking, giving the back history. Because what's happened in Galatians in, in that day and age is people have, um, well, let me make it more specific. Up until Yeshua died on the cross, people made the sacrifice of the lamb. They did the sacrificial system for their salvation. Then Yeshua came, and the believers in Yeshua realized, and Hebrews tells us all about it, you don't need to do the sacrifices anymore. This is the perfect Lamb of God. He's taken away the sin of the world. So they're let, letting go of the sacrificial system. They're still involved in the temple. They're still doing the hours of prayer. They're still doing other things. Paul talks about the things that he did. He went up to Jerusalem for Passover. You know, we still see it carrying on. In this time, you had those who called themselves Pharisees that came against Yeshua Jesus. They were all wound up in, it's got to be this way, and this is how the law is. And they believed in an afterlife. You had a group of people that didn't believe in an afterlife, but believed that they had the right slant on God, and they were called Sadducees. If you mix those two words, the Pharisees believed in resurrection, life after death. So they were fair icy. If you, you were a part of the Sadducees, you did not believe in resurrection or life after you, your body dies. So they are sad, you see. <laughs> that way you'll always remember those two groups. Well, they would be called sects, S-E-C-T-S, sects of Judaism. The Pharisees believed this way. The Gnostics were another group. They were all about head knowledge, the Sadducees. What they did with the Hebrew believers, or the Hebrew Christians, as I like to call them, because I know what the word Christian means. <laughs> and they, what the Hebrew believers did was they kept, like I said, Paul still went up and celebrated Passover, but they let go of the sacrificial system. Well, at first, they were welcome in the temple like any of the other groups. They made room for the disagreements, and they kind of all just did their own thing. But now, these Hebrew believers were speaking against Moshe, against Moses, as far as the Pharisees and the others were concerned. And this was carrying it too far, because they were saying, you don't have to keep the law of Moshe. And a battle ensued. The church even had to get involved in this. The early church had to have a Jerusalem council. What did the Gentile believers need to do? What did the Jewish believers need to do? The book of Galatians was written to a group of Jewish believers who, because they didn't have the scriptures, 
They didn't have years of teaching. They hadn't gotten a chance to really get get um, their feet solid in, in the new that God had done, opening the new way through Yeshua Jesus. They started to question whether they were right in letting go of the sacrificial system. And the boot, the Jewish leaders in the temple were now saying, you're not welcome. You're not speaking it our way. We want you guys out. So the Hebrew believers are getting kicked out of the temple. They haven't been doing the sacrifices. They're seeing persecution, and their little minds are going, did we get it right? Maybe we're wrong. And, you know, we grew up all those years being told, if we're not a part of the commonwealth of Israel, we're cut off, and we're going to miss the blessings of God. So if his Messiah does come, if it wasn't Yeshua and his Messiah does come and we're outside the temple because of what we're doing and they're not letting us in, we might miss out. Maybe we better go back and do the sacrifices. And as is so often, habits that you grow up with that are established in you for years have a stranglehold on you. A habit is a very hard thing to get rid of. In a Yiddish proverb, if you it, watch the habits you form, because if you have a habit that you want to get rid of, and you get rid of the H, you still have a bit. If you get rid of the A, you still have a bit. And if you get rid of the B, you still have it. And that's how hard a habit is to break. So watch your habits. And here we see it in the sense that these who really were believers in Yeshua were starting to think that they had to go back. The book of Hebrews is written to direct them. Don't go back. Stay with it. You've got it right. You have a better sacrifice, a better priest, a better priesthood. You have all the betters. The Galatian Judaizers were the ones that were saying, okay, but the Gentiles, they can't just get in and just be accepted. They've got to keep our law. So we're going to put them under law, and we're going to make them keep our laws, just like we've had to do for salvation. Well, God has made a change. They're not having to keep law for salvation. Now, does that mean that all law gets thrown out? No. Is it ever okay to murder, to steal, to covet, to commit adultery, etc., etc.? Of course not. So it's not a matter of throwing law out, but it's a matter of saying we don't keep the law for our salvation. We put our faith for our salvation in Yeshua, the Lamb of God, and then we stay in obedience to Him by still keeping Torah, by still keeping law and instruction that God's given. So Paul's trying to help there be this balance. And this is where the Jerusalem Council comes in and decides, okay, there are four things the Gentiles have got to do. They've got to abstain from uh, things offered to idols, it's abstain from blood, not commit adultery, and what's the fourth? There's the fourth one. They're so basic. Um, there were four things anyway that they said, the Gentiles can be free, but they can't do these things because these things are just too much of a stumbling block to the Jews. So if they're going to come in and we're going to worship side by side, they've got to adhere to those. And everybody said, okay. So that's basically how we go on. Unfortunately, you get down to today, and well, long before today, in the early hundreds and two hundreds, you had still a, a sibling rivalry, I'm going to call it, between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. You had butting of heads, you had misunderstandings, you had schisms, you had them pull apart, and by the, the third century, which is your two hundreds, you really have those like Constantine comes into play and he, all he cares about is uniting his people no matter what they believe, he just wants unity. And you have things being said about the Jews that started from the beginning. Oh, Jews were bad. Jews put their Messiah to death. They, they killed Christ. So they should be out. They should be allowed in the church. There's no forgiveness for them. The Jews are damned. They're com committed to hell. They blew it. They missed their chance. God's got the church now. The church gets all their blessings. Doesn't give them their curses if they don't obey, but gives them all the blessings. Okay, and you have this schism grow more and more. So that there's literally a time period that if you, Gentile or Jewish, attend a Passover or something along that line, you can be put in jail. You can have all of your, your possessions taken from you. You can be stripped of everything because the Jews are anathema. 
And as that goes on, we we get into a bit of a better balance later, but we never get back to the the one new man, Jew and Gentile, side by side, worshiping God together in shalom, in peace. We always have the struggles and the battles, and then you bring into that different doctrinal beliefs, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and you got all your mishpagash, everything, all this mess that we still deal with today. So this is early on, and this is what Galatians and Hebrews and these other books are having to deal with, is all of these different issues. How do we get on that same page? So when we talk about law, we're talking about the law that God gave Moshe when they came out of Egypt. They went into the time that they had to keep the law to show their faith in the coming Messiah who was symbolized in the sacrificial system, in that law, etc., etc. And that's what they needed to do to prove their salvation. Where today we are not under that law, we're, we're saved from the condemnation of that law, we're under grace, where by grace you're saved through faith. Gift of God, not of your works, lest any man should boast. So there's your balance for today, and I don't remember how I got way off on that, and I know Rhonda has a question, so I'm going to let her get in here. Oh, no, nope, I cleared it up. I cleared it up. Okay, I talked long enough. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember why I got up and I didn't complete it, I'll come back to it. But I hope that helps you understand, you know, how things developed and why and where we're at. And it's still controversy today. There are still those who come against me as a Jewish person today want to strip me of all of my Jewishness and say that I have to leave that all behind because I am a, quote, Christian now. Now, definition of a Christian is a follower of Christ. How do we get the name Christ? That's the English word for the Hebrew word Messiah. Very good. You've got it. Mashiach. So, if a follower... Uh, if a Christian is a follower of Christ, then a Christian is a follower of the Messiah, okay? So, if I'm Jewish, and I want to believe in my Jewish Messiah, be obedient to the Jewish scriptures, which is the holy word of God, how does that keep me from being a Christian, and why do I have to leave all the Jewishness behind and become a Gentile? which you can't really do even if you want to because you are what you're born. <laughs> but that's the argument even to this day. And I do not understand it. And at the same time, I want to say to my Jewish people who are afraid to believe in Yeshua, Jesus, in Messiah, Christ, it's not going to make you less Jewish. You are what you're born. And if anything, you're going to appreciate your Jewishness all the more and it's going to enhance your understanding of the scriptures because as you all are here in my class wanting the Jewish view, you do see a bigger picture, don't you? Or as I like to say, you got it all in black and white, dear Gentiles, but we'll give you a little bit of color. <laughs> Same thing, but color you see more depth and, you know, it just takes on a, a shine, <laughs> okay? So here, here is where it's at, where it boils down to, where we should be on that same page today. And I guess I got there because in Galatians, we're talking about the law. When the law came in, did it void the promise God had made with Abraham? Because you've already seen, you've been with me long enough in Genesis now, we saw in the Garden of Eden, they were innocent. They didn't even have a conscience. They didn't know, oh, this is right and this is wrong and let me weigh the consequences. All they knew in their innocence was they were to obey the voice of the Lord. They failed. That brought them into the time of conscience where their mind could convict them. They could feel, oh, I shouldn't do that. If I do that, I'm naughty. And they had that time of conviction there. They failed in that. Murder, first murder, under the time of conscience. When God gets done showing them, you can't, there's no way that you're going to get it right with God and be right before God under innocence or under conscience. Now he's moving them into the time of promise. This is going to be everything unconditional. God says in promise, I will, I will, I will, I will. Okay? They just come in under the promise, believe in the promise, act accordingly, and they're going to show their belief in the God of salvation 
in what is coming. When they fail under promise, we have all the disobedience, we have them walk away from the promise of God, we have them go into slavery, well first into Egypt, and finally into slavery, then when they come out of slavery, they're going to go into the time called law. They're going to have to keep all the commandments of God to, for salvation. And God says, you can't do that, and I know you can't do that, so I'll make the sacrificial system. You'll make sacrifices to cover your sins. Not wash them away yet, because the, my plan of salvation since the garden, since there was a need, even before there was a need, is and always will be through my son, through the saving shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. Now you're going to see that pictured in the sacrificial system that you're going to do to make up for your mistakes, to cover your sins, and you'll move along in that until it's actually happened. When it's actually happened, then you're going to let go of law and move into this time called grace. This is where we are now, the age of grace. And in this time of grace, you do not need to make the sacrifices. That's why we're not condemned for not making the sacrifices. And I mean we Jewish people even, because the only place you can make those sacrifices is at the temple in Jerusalem. Well, there is no temple. For a couple thousand years, there was no Jewish Jerusalem. Now we've got a divided Jerusalem. It is still under entirely, in, in totality, is, is Israel's control. But you know all the that's going on with that. That'll finally get settled to a false peace. And in that false peace, in that tribulation period, guess what they do? They set up the temple. They reestablish sacrifices because they think they are still needing that sacrificial system. This is the ultra-religious that are looking for that. They think right now God will forgive them on the basis of their prayers. They're begging for forgiveness, their good deeds. They hope that they can do good enough, and that's why the books are open, and God judges once a year and says, okay, you're good enough to live another year. You're not. But then they can't understand why a good person dies and a bad person lives. So there's, there's issues. <coughs> but when we end the age of grace, it's open now for all, Jew or Gentile. It will end when the Lord takes us up in rapture into heaven. The Holy Spirit who seals us right now will take us with him into heaven. We're guaranteed our place forever. We will come out of heaven to rule and reign with the Lord, but that's our home. That's our home base. That's our citizenship. That's where we belong right now. We're ambassadors. We're representing our God to the world, and that's what we should be doing. The people on earth will be living under the time like it was under law before that's why the sacrificial system is back, and they'll be living under that condition that they've got to keep to prove that, that, that they believe in a sacrifice for forgiveness of sin. The true believers will know the sacrifice is Yeshua. The, the um, religious will try to do it through the animals, the blood of bulls and goats and, and sheep again, but they will not be keeping themselves saved because salvation's only through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. So even though they're, they've got a form of godliness, they're not going to be right with God unless they come into saving faith of Yeshua Jesus. That never changes. That's the same all the way through. When we get past the tribulation, which, by the way, they fail in law. No, they, don't, they don't keep the law perfectly. They fail in grace because in grace, unless you come into faith in Yeshua and trust Him, you lose, you, you, when you die, you do not get to go into heaven. You don't get there because you did enough good works or anything else, only by your faith. When they've moved back under that law time in the tribulation, they're still trying to keep the law like before, and they won't. Now, finally, that judgment falls, the tribulation ends, and those who go into the millennial kingdom, which is the next period of time that God deals with man in a, in a different way, the Lord is going to sit on the throne, there will be perfect rule and perfect reign, and they will live in a different set of circumstances. It's not the law of before, but they'll have to keep the law of the Lord in the land. They'll have to be obedient to the Lord. They have to come up to the temple for their nations to get rain, etc., etc. And yet, even in that time, in a perfect environment on this earth, there's still going to be so many 
when they're given the chance to show that they want to pledge allegiance to Satan, that they're going to do that instead of pledging allegiance to the Lord, even when they've lived under his perfect rule. Amazing. But that's man's pride. I want to do it my way. I'm good enough. I don't need the Lord. And so they're going to follow Satan to their complete demise because this is when he's, God's going to come fire out of heaven. Satan's going to be cast in like a fire. Great white throne judgment's going to take place, etc., etc. And we'll go into God's eternity that we don't know what's coming. The best is yet to come, but we don't know what it is. So here we have all these different times, these different periods, these different ways that God deals with man. But the one line going all the way through is salvation through belief in Yeshua Jesus and his atoning work. And that's the only way to get saved. Now, I'm going to give you the name because I want you to understand. The name is controversial, but what I just taught to you is what is called dispensations. And the word dispensation just simply means a period of time that God deals with man with certain rules certain regulations, man fails, there's a judgment, and we move on and see the new dispensation, a new period of time in God dealing in a new way. So, if you believe what I've just taught, then you believe in dispensations. Now, I only throw that out there because you're going to hear that, but people like to argue. I'm not one who likes to argue. I will stand my ground and defend what I believe. If you don't like the word, throw the word out. If you don't believe what I just said, find in scripture where I'm wrong and come show me. If you can convince me from the word of God, I'll get up here and I'll tell it in front of the camera. <laughs> but if you can't prove it to me from the word of God, then I'm not going to accept it. The title, the name is only given by man, although you will see there is a reference and I want to say it's in Galatians where Paul himself says the dispensation of grace was given to him to explain it to us. And that's true. And that's probably where they chose the word. But like I say, if you call it up for a, a definition, it talks about it being a period of time, certain rules and regulations, and the consequences that come from it. So I didn't mean to get off on all that, but it really is pertinent and critical because we do see different times. I'll give you an example. Under law, we're told, forgive, and you will be forgiven. In grace, we're told, forgive because you are forgiven. Big difference there. Now, if you don't see different times that God's dealing in different ways, then you have to say, well, now I've got a problem because Scripture doesn't agree with Scripture. But the whole Bible is to us. Let me put it this way. The whole Bible is for us. But the whole Bible isn't to us in the sense when God gave them law living down in when they came out of Egypt in that time that was specifically to them yeah can we learn lessons yes absolutely from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 we can learn lessons but what God gives for instruction in the tribulation and we're not in that period has no relevance to us in that way as it didn't for for um, let's just pick who, who don't want to pick. Let's say, well, let's go back to Noah's day. The tribulation wasn't Noah's day. So when we look at what happens in the tribulation and what God says to do, it's a different time. All the way through we see God telling man how to relate to him in time. And sometimes there's a big difference like the forgive that I just gave for an example. And sometimes you can't hardly see a difference at all. But again, even through the dispensational teaching, there's one way of salvation. Some say, well, this opens up to replacement theology. No, it doesn't. Even in dispensations, God, we do not teach that God is through with the Jew. We teach Romans 9, 10, and 11, where we read that God has set aside his program with Israel for a time. He says, I've set aside Israel for a time to bring in the Gentiles. When their number is full, they've been grafted in completely, and I'm going to go back and finish my plan with Israel. Gentiles during this time, provoke my people to jealousy. Pick up the love of the Jewish scriptures. 
the love of the Jewish Messiah. Show them you're missing something. It was yours. You've missed it. I've got it, but not I've got it and you can't have it. No, I've got it and you can have it too. And we're grafted into the same root, the root issue with Jesus. It believes fully in God fully fulfilling every promise to Israel, every promise to the nation as a whole. And it continues on with that theme, and you see it in the next times as we go on, especially in the millennial reign when the fullness of the promises to the nation of Israel come in. And that's also how you can have a verse like Romans 11, 25 and 26 that says, then all Israel will be saved. Now, if you look at Israel today, I love my beloved homeland, <laughs> but when I look at Israel, are they a godly people living godly lives, worshiping God, and it's filling the face of their, what's called Israel on the map? Sadly, no. There are a minority in number who are there who are doing that, but the majority, like the United States and everywhere else, the majority is not doing that. So Israel, how's a whole nation going to get saved? What it's meaning is national Israel is going to receive the promises. She's going to be saved. She's going to come through the tribulation, and God's going to bring her into his promises because he said, I will. And we're going to deal with that as soon as we get back here with, with Abraham, because this is where the I wills come in. God said, I will. If he said he will and he quits at some point, then he's lied to us. And then he could lie to us about our salvation today. I won't give any room for that. My God does not lie. My God does not quit. My God does not change his mind. So what he promised Israel to the nation, which he's going to show through Abraham, is promising to the nation, to the descendants, he's going to fulfill in the millennial reign. We will see it just before the start of the millennial reign, at the end of the tribulation, when this judgment has brought those who will get saved to their knees. They are the ones who are going to cry out for the coming of the Lord, who are going to look up at his return and say, he is our Messiah. And that's the nation that will be saved and will move into the millennial kingdom because God promised there would always be a nation of Israel. If he didn't, Israel would be wiped off the face of the map at this time because of the battles and all that are going on. She'd, she'd lose. But because God's on her side and he's keeping his faithful promise to Abraham, He's going to fulfill it then. So it gives no room for replacement theology. If anything, it strengthens the view that God keeps his word to the Jews, to the nation. He keeps his word to the believers also. Doesn't leave them out. Gentiles could get saved all the way through time also. You didn't even have a Jew till you get into the time of, of Yaakov and his sons, and the name comes out of the 12 tribes, out of um, Judah in particular. Abraham was not Jewish. There wasn't such a thing then. He was a Syrian. He came from the area that was known for Syria. He was, he was called an Edomian. You have to understand that to say, okay, then you've got to realize when we talk about the Jew nationally, the Jew culturally, the Jew ethnically, that's different than the Jewish person who says, my faith is in Yeshua, Jesus. Now we're talking about the spiritual. And the Jew and the Gentile have to be in that same faith for salvation. But God does not do away with the land of Israel, the national Israel, and the promises he made to her because God's faithful, period. It's the only reason why. Not because they deserve it, not because they earn it, but because God promised it, and God is faithful. Okay? Did I lose you all? Okay. <laughs> Do I need to get off my sandbox? <laughs> yes, Rhonda. Yeah, I hope she can unmute. She's trying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm not running out on you, Rhonda, but you know how you, you always get caught when you go <laughs> away? Okay. Did that work? Try to unmute, Rhonda? Yes. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Yay! technician. <laughs> I'm learning. So for clarification, yes. when that scripture says all of, all of Israel shall be saved, it's talking about 
after the fullness of time, meaning all that is supposed to happen with the Gentiles uh, happens, then those Israelites, those Jewish people that exist at that point in time, there will be a time when they all acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. And it's going to be all of them coming to the same state of mind. That time will come at the end of the seven years of tribulation. The period of the seven years of tribulation, many are going to lose their lives, Jew and Gentile. Many are going to die during that time. When we get to the very, very end, when we have the battle of Armageddon, where the Lord is coming out of the sky, Revelation 19, he's going to slay the, the um, Antichrist with the sword, which is the word out of his mouth. At that same time, Zechariah, Chapter 10, verse 12 tells us, and I'm going to take you there because this is critically important. It doesn't happen before it happens. That's why they'll say in that day because, come on, tablet, let me in. Because it's not like, you know, there's a period of time. It's at that very moment. I believe that either, um, let's see, Zechariah 12, either they are on that fence thinking, I think this is right, and they're becoming convinced, or they have already become convinced right at that time that all of this is happening in those moments. Then they are seeing, and verse 12 says, uh, verse 10, I'm sorry, it says, I will pour out on the house of David, on those living in Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and prayer. That's God pouring out His grace on them and the, the relationship that we have with Him in prayer. It isn't that God prays for them, but that's prayer is our communication with the Lord. Let me put it that way. They will look on me whom they have pierced. That means that we we're now talking about Yeshua Jesus. We started out with God pouring out on the house of David. He's pouring out the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So we see the whole triunity of God involved in this verse. But at that time, they will look on me whom they have pierced. And how do they respond? Do they respond at that point by denying? No. They mourn for him as one mourns for, I lost my place, for an only son. They'll be in bitterness on his behalf like the bitterness for a firstborn son. What that is, is at that moment, as they're looking up and he's starting his return, they're going to say, he is the Messiah. He was the Messiah. We believe in him. He, it, he was here and he is returning. And at that moment, their hearts have been so prepared, they're accepting him or they're already in that point of acceptance saying, look, look, here he is, we've been telling you. And that they will see the salvation of the Lord come down to earth and then as he sets up his kingdom for who goes into that kingdom, there is that judgment right there. The only ones who go into that kingdom are those who are saved. Because you've got your Gentiles mixed in there also, and they're not going to go into the kingdom unsaved. The only ones that get to go into the kingdom, which is in Israel, starts in Israel, fills the face of the earth, it starts with believers only. So is at that very moment, God knows the heart. He knows the reception of the heart. It's the same thing as the thief dying on the cross. In the last moments of his life, he got saved. God doesn't deny and say, oh, get off your cross and go do something for me, and then I'll, I'll think about it. No. In those last moments of their life, when they realize and they bow the knee in the heart to, to the Lord, they accept him as Messiah, they will be saved. And that's at the time that the nation then, it says, in essence, the nation's crying out and saying, this is, this is our Messiah. Okay, but these are not the ones that went to hide. These are the ones right. that unbelievers that stay behind and go through right. the tribulation. Right, and you've got, say, people who are in hiding, who will come out of their hiding places as they see the Lord return. And they also, of course, are declaring because they believed in him. That's why they knew to go hide, because they had read the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, that's why you have those who are saved and those who at that last moment get saved. Remember, the Lord isn't willing that any should perish, 
he's he you know we get hung up on this and we think and I've had it thrown in my face oh then you want to tell me if Hitler in his last moment of life said God forgive me I'm a sinner then I have to share heaven with Hitler <laughs> and I said well number one you're not going to have any animosity or hatred or anger or anything to deal with in heaven okay so your attitude gets checked long before you're in heaven it's gone okay but the point is yes it is what I'm saying now does one who is as depraved who is <clears throat> demon controlled who is so much a puppet of Satan do I think that that one really legitimately with their whole heart turns to the Lord no I honestly don't think Hitler did in the last moments of his life but thankfully for every person on the face of this earth, I'm not their judge. God sees their heart. God knows the intent of the heart. God's not going to be fooled. Oh, I'll show. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you know, and I beg forgiveness. No, God knows where that heart is. And yes, a thief, a murderer, a convicted person, or whatever horrendous crime you want to put on that, can be given forgiveness the same way I can be because in God's book my sin is just as bad as his sin and his sin is just as equal as my sin God doesn't put the oh this one's a bigger one you know so you need you got to be saved more let me let me dunk you in baptism three times for this one and this one just once no this is all man concoctions this is all man's it really it's it's our it's our depravity we want we think this is how it ought to be that's not fair we're the little kid throwing the temper tantrum because that one got a bigger cookie than I got you know or or that one shouldn't have gotten any cookie but God looks past and he just sees the heart he sees a truly repent and he says I died for you I raised from the dead for you, come into my abundant life. He doesn't say, tell me what sins you did first and I'll weigh the consequences. We're the ones that do that. So um, we have to understand that. We have to realize if we see through God's eyes how differently we look at this. And honestly, even for the most unloved person on the face of this earth, Wrap your head around the fact that God loves that one as much as he loves you, as much as he loves me. That's amazing grace. That's our God. And that's why he says, I'm not willing that any should perish. He died for all. And why he is the judge of the heart. But again, if it's not a real heart um, turn, you know, a heart, heart. Conversion, yeah. Transformation. Yes. Transformation. Yes, transformation. Yeah. Then, no, God's not fooled. God's not fooled. And judgment will be served. Justice will be served. Look at Paul, and I'll get to you, Roger, and then Maria. Look at Paul. He murdered the believers. He said about trying to stop this early church. He wanted to cut it off at the knees. He rounded up women as well as men. He was after them. He was on the way to get more when God knocked him off his high horse and said, Hey, <laughs> you're fighting against me. <laughs> Paul could never forgive himself. Read his words. I'm the chief of sinners. And I don't think he ever fully forgave himself for all that he had done. He set about to do all he could to make up for it, and he thanked God for his salvation. But I think he always, I think he went to his grave feeling remorseful for what he had done. Truly repent, truly changed heart. God forgave him. That's the requirement. It's a heart that says, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Roger? Did you say anything about the two thieves on the cross? Yes. Well, not about both thieves. I said about the one thief, yes. Because both of them at first started, didn't they? And well, then the other one turned. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they were, their attitudes were not right, yes. Yes. And the one never turned and the other one did. And then you look at King David and what he did. David sinned greatly. 
and felt the remorse. He suffered consequences, but he felt remorseful, and God did forgive him. And God still said he was a man after his own heart. Yes. After all that. Yeah. I mean, he said, yes, man after God's own heart, and yet he had murder on his hands. Yes. You know, and again, I'm equating murder as a bigger or bad or sin. <laughs> I say that with bad English on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. But again, your little white lie, your little not doing something you know that you should have done is as great and as grievous to a holy God as that murder, as that you know, <laughs> what to us seems unforgivable. But you have to see it from God's view. Uh, Maria, and you need to admit yourself. There she goes. <laughs> it's they're struggling with her. He's trying to. There yeah, we go. No, no uh, you, you, you covered it. Oh, okay. Um, what I was gonna, what I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Did I throw out too much? Are you confused? Or, you know, this is really laying it out. This is, to me, the backbone of Scripture, and when this is online, just like when you need an alignment with the chiropractor, when, you're, when your skeleton is not lying, you hurt, but when everything is aligned, it just hangs right. And I believe this is the backbone of Scripture that helps it hang so that we can understand, because again, the whole Word of God is for us, and we learn from law, we learn from grace, we learn from tribulation, we learn from millennium, you know, there are principles, there are, you know, we can learn from any situation, any time. But you've got to know whose mail you're reading. And you can not get in trouble by reading somebody else's mail. Because if God's giving direction to the nation of Israel, and you read it for you today as the church, you're going to have trouble. That's honestly why people have the confusion about the tribulation. God told Israel you will go through the time of Jacob's trouble. That's Jeremiah 30, verse 7. You will go through it, and I'll bring you out of it. God just lays it out as clear as clear can be. When the church looks at Jeremiah, reads that verse, and says, oh, that's us. We're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, and we're going to come out. Then they get into that doctrinal belief. But I want to ask you, where was the church in Jeremiah's day? Did Jeremiah go to church? No, he was a good Jewish boy. He went to the temple. He said the same prayers that I said Daniel was saying. You know, or I don't mean word for word because I don't know when all the formulas came in. But he went to the temple and prayed. He made the sacrifices. He preached to the people living in Israel. Repent or you're going to go into captivity. And what happened? They threw him in the pit and they went into captivity. He was not preaching to the church. Now, can we learn lessons from that and say, if I disobey God, I'm going to suffer consequences? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. But I'm not going to say, oh, because God told Israel they're going through the tribulation. I'm not living in Jeremiah's day. I'm living in the day that Paul was raised up as our, our instructor, giving us the instructions of how to live under the mm -hmm. time of grace. Mm -hmm. And the time of grace includes the rapture verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. 2 Thessalonians directly says, you got a letter. You're scared because you think I wrote you that letter, Paul's speaking. You think I wrote you that letter and told you you missed it. You're in the tribulation. And I'm here to tell you, whoa, no, you're not. This happens first and this happens first. And you know one of the things that happens before the tribulation? The the, let's look, 2 Thessalonians 2. I know I'm off today, but I'm hoping it's the Spirit of God directing. 2 Thessalonians 2, and I think it's verse, let's see, there's 6 or 7. Whoops, why can't it find 2 Thessalonians? What did I do wrong? Why can it not find 2 Thessalonians? Just because I wanted to hurry. 2 Thessalonians 2. two. Yes, chapter 2. There we go. Okay. Okay, so. 2 Thessalonians means there was a 1 Thessalonians, right? Everybody agree? Yeah, you can't have yes. two till you have one, okay? So, in the beginning, we know that, that Paul wrote a letter to Thessaloniki. Now, in that letter, in the fourth chapter, and he didn't write chapter and verse, he wrote a letter, just like you do today. Paragraphs, you wrote a letter. 
But for us to simplify where to find your place in that letter, we had people who broke it down, put it into chapters and verses so I can get you there fast to write where I want you to be. So toward the end of the letter, the first letter, we have 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. We have the great view of the rapture that we, those who are dead in Christ will be raised. Those who are alive will, will also be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, those are rapture verses. They're also, like I say, in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us about it, and then there are other places. Now, if you've just written a letter to your friend, and you've told your friend, here's how it goes. When you write your second letter, you're going to pick up where you left off. You know that they've got this first letter. Okay, so that's why he says, Now we request, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that you don't be quickly shaken. Okay, he didn't need to go explain what the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together with him is, because chapter 4 used those words that we would be gathered together with him. It made it very clear. You pick up that second letter, you're saying, oh, Paul's talking about what he just said here at the end of that first letter he sent us. And that's when he goes into the second verse and says, don't be so quickly shaken. They were so scared they lost their composure. Don't be so disturbed either by a spirit coming and disturbing you because we know Satan sends his, his spirits to confuse and to bother you. Or get this, a message or a letter as if from us. Hello, you think you got a letter, somebody signed their name to it, they told you you're in the tribulation, and eh, I didn't send you that letter. That didn't come from me. I just told you, this is what happens. We are looking for the rapture. And Paul says it very clearly. He looked for the rapture. He didn't know how much time was going to pass. He had great reason to look for the rapture because he didn't have as many road marks laid out for him as we do since we have more. We have John's revelation also to tell us, you know, and so forth and so on. So he said, hey, don't get so shook that, that this letter that you've gotten says to the effect, and I'm in the middle of verse 2, that the day of the Lord has come. If you've been with me long enough, you know the day of the Lord is a term for the tribulation. Proven by all the prophets, every time they refer to the day of the Lord is what we read in the book of Revelation. They all talk the same language, okay? So, don't be deceived, verse 3, that will not come. The tribulation will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Now, everybody stops right there and says, I know what apostasy means. I know what that means. That's falling away from the faith. So we're going to have this great falling away from the faith, and then the tribulation is going to come. Well, one of the problems with that is, when do we call it a great apostasy? Because I can look back through 2,000 years, and I see apostasy all the way through. Might be growing in number, but I see great times in the dark ages where faith was very hard to find. There has been apostasy all along. What did the word mean back in Paul's day? And when you go into the Greek and into the definitions and the understanding, you find out that you could use different words for what was meant. You could use the words until the great catching away or snatching away comes first. And the picture is a violent snatch. If I snatched Anne right now and I threw her on the other side of the room, that would be a great <laughs> snatching, okay? When we are raptured, it's a wonderful, great snatching. We're caught up from this earth and we're boom, up in the presence of the Lord faster than my fingers just snapped, okay? It is a catching away, a snatching away. When we see Philip being caught up and deposited in another area, and you read about that in Acts chapter 7, it uses the same word, the catching away. It's the same word as apostasy here. So, in context, in the understanding of the word in that day, we could also read right here that there, this snatching away comes first. Paul's just told him, you're going to be caught up. So let's call it caught up. Let's call it the catching away, okay? You're going to be caught up first. That happens first. 
Now, is it true that there's an apostasy in our day and age and what it means? Yes. Was that true in Paul's day? Yes. So you can give it a double meaning if you want. I have no problem with that. Everybody isn't going to believe. There's never going to be a time. There's always going to be those who fall away from the faith. There's always going to be those that you think are saved. There are those who they think they're saved. They're going to stand before the Lord in judgment one day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and that in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Okay, now if you never knew them, they didn't fall away in the sense they were saved and they lost. But they weren't in it. There was a, an apostasy. There was a camouflage. So you can have both meanings. You can keep both. I don't have any problem with that. But don't take away from it the catching away. Because Paul's talking on the basis of the letter he just wrote to them. He knows what's in their mind. He knows where they're coming from. He knows the language, and he's giving them the same thing. And I think it really would have been, in my humble opinion, better if it would have been translated until the great catching away comes first, but they mm -hmm. chose the word apostasy. And I'm not going to argue because God says every word is inerrant. So I, I bow to my God. Isn't that hard? But, Harpazio too? Yes, it's Harpazio. Yeah. Yes, in the in the Greek. Yes. What verse are you on? Right now I'm back in Second Thessalonians two and I'm in the middle of verse three. So that apostasy, that that catching away first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. Okay? That's what's going to happen. There's gonna be a catching away and the man of sin is going to be revealed. Now, we know that's the Antichrist. We know that name. So you're going to say, oh, well, wait a minute. That's got to happen first. No, that happens with the start of the tribulation because keep reading. What we're reading is let no one deceive you. This catching away won't happen until the, the apostasy, until the catching away. And the man with the lawlessness is revealed. It's in the destruction. It describes him, opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. My Thing jump. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. Do you not remember while I was with you? I was telling you these things. See, he's drawing on his time and his, what he's written to them. Now, catch verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness. Here's your lawless man. Okay, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, I totally agree that this is translated correctly with the word he. It doesn't say a, until a power is taken away, that there's a power. It says he. It says that there's a mystery of lawlessness. There's a, a, a lawlessness that's going to run rampant. It's already at work. We see the start of it. We just said earlier how much evil is in the face of this world. Okay? There's an evil going on. It's not as great as it's going to be, but it's great. It, it, it's already at work. Only, the reason why it's not as great as it will be is now, right now, res, um, only he who now restrains will do so. So something is holding this man of lawlessness back. He's keeping him from being revealed. He's keeping him from being able to work it freely and greatly. Something's holding back this tide of evil. When that changes, when this, he who's doing that, when he's taken out of the man of lawlessness way, then the lawless man will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay, and it goes on. Okay, so... The Antichrist is going to be revealed when something that's holding, or someone who's holding him back is taken out of his way. Now, who can hold back the power of the Antichrist? Who can hold back his revealing? Who can go back, hold back his dastardly deeds? God. God. Jesus. Yeshua, the Holy Spirit, three in one. It's the only, because Satan, we even know, is going to indwell the Antichrist and work his evil on a greater scale than ever before at that time. That's midpoint tribulation. So what we're being told very clearly is the Holy Spirit's holding that back. When the Holy Spirit is moved out of his way, then, okay, forgive me, 
all hell is going to break loose, okay? <laughs> Just forgive me, but it fits, all right? So, when is the Holy Spirit going to be removed out of the way of the Antichrist on this earth? <coughs> Say it, Rhonda. Unmute yourself. I see your mouth going, and I'm sure you're answering right. Say it. Rapture. 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 When we are caught up, we are told the Holy Spirit, our engagement ring, who is the one that has sealed us, is the one who's going to deliver us to heaven. That's when he's taken out with us, taking us out in rapture. Now, the Antichrist is free. Boom. He's going to go. He's going to come out at first looking like the greatest thing since sliced cheese. All the flatteries, all the skillful lies, all the camouflage. She's going to look wonderful. He's going to bring peace between Israel and the Arab world. And nobody's been able to do that for how many thousands of years? But, oh, look at him. Let's follow him. And he's going to build them up to the point of worshiping him, which is at that midpoint when he puts himself in the temple that he's allowed the Jews to rebuild, I believe, and says, now you're going to worship me here. But it's the Holy Spirit who's holding him back. And as soon as I say that, that the Holy Spirit goes, then I hear the ones who want to oppose me say, oh, well, now with the Holy Spirit gone on the face of the earth, then how does anyone ever get saved? Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't tug, you don't respond. And they say, no problem. Did people get saved before the church age began? Were yes. they not saved all the way back from the garden and all the way yes. through? The Holy Spirit came on and worked through and tugged oh. out through all the time. Adam and Eve wouldn't be saved if the Holy Spirit didn't tug at them. <laughs> it's yeah. not the church. And if you think the church is holding back the tide of evil and holding back the Antichrist, well, hello, wake up, because I have news for you. I do not see our church doing that. I see our yes. churches, sadly, they couldn't handle the COVID virus. How do you think they'd handle the Antichrist? I'm sorry. I'm stepping on toes, but it's true. You know, we, we are so blessed because we are the dispensation where yes. the Holy Spirit indwells us. Yes, and it's the only time we see the indwelling, the sealing. Now, God is through His Holy Spirit, and I'll get you next, Maria. God through His Holy Spirit came on David, and David did a great work for him. David prayed, don't take your Holy Spirit from me, because he knew the joy of the Spirit, and he didn't want to be devoid of it. We are never taught in the age of grace to pray, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. God says instead, he's with you, he sealed you, he keeps you to the day that you're deposited in heaven. He's your guarantee. So there's your change. He's taken out in rapture, tribulation, it's on. There's your lineup. So you see how we learn from everything? But if we go back and say, oh, but Jacob goes through it, yes. What was Jacob's other name? Israel, not the church, Israel. <laughs> so you've got to keep what God said to Israel to Israel. Keep what God says to the church to the church. Keep what God says to tribulation saints to tribulation saints. And saints are simply saved people. There were people saved in Old Testament days. They're called Old Testament saints. So the word saint, when you see it in Revelation, does that mean church age saints? That means tribulation saints. It all falls into place. I know I'm on my sandbox. Maria? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, uh, 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians uh, 2, 3, and uh, in the New King James Version, it says, Let no, no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless that falling away comes first. Yes. So over here it doesn't say apostasy. Okay. But it says the falling away. Okay. And what is the falling away? You just have to be, you know, the rapture, but also... Um, in, in uh, uh, you know, when he says, uh, uh, says, who opposes, exalts himself above all uh, that is worship, uh, right. showing himself that he's got to not, uh, I remember, then he says, and now the one, he says, that number six, 
and now you know that is uh, what is restraining that that he may be revealed in his own time. Right. But I was noticing that in, in, in the one it had a, um, a capital H E. Mm -hmm. And it, it further down in seven, it is for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, with the capital H, right, who who now restrains will do will do so until he is taken right, out right, of the way. And obviously that he can't be the antichrist because he's not going to get in his own way. No, he's not going to hold himself no. back. He's going to let himself go. <laughs> Yes. yes, right, right. Yes, so yes, you just have to read and keep it in context, and you have to look at who's being talked to, who's being spoken to, and then it, it lays itself out. So we really did get off track in class today. I <laughs> hope for those of you who wanted Genesis, you don't feel I did you a disservice, but I feel it is critical for us to understand there's so much out there that is misteaching that scares people. And let me tell you, if you believe that you have to go through even half of the tribulation first before the rapture can occur, then how is the rapture a blessed hope? How is it something to look forward to? Because if you think the first three and a half years is a cakewalk, open your Bible. Start reading. Read Revelation chapter 6 where the revelation, I mean, where the tribulation starts. I do mm -hmm. not see a cakewalk. I see, mm -hmm. yes, the Antichrist says peace, peace, but I see famine, I see war, I see pestilence, I see death. The four horsemen that ride through in chapter 6, not one of those is a cakewalk, and one of them does describe the, the Antichrist and his false peace. He comes as if he doesn't have a, an arrow, he's just got a bow, but he's got his arrow, it's just hidden from view. And it's going to be in action. And you think it's great to pledge allegiance to the Antichrist who's giving you your, your social, you know, whatever, your money and your food and all of that. And then he's going to say, now if you don't have my mark, you don't get to eat. You know, here, I've, I've increased your appetite. Now, here's the cost. You. You've got to pledge mm. allegiance to me. And that mark is not accidental. That is, I pledge allegiance to the Antichrist. That's what they're basically doing, and they're going to know it. They're pledging their allegiance to make him their God, to make him their leader, and to follow him. So, it, yes, he comes on with a guise of falseness, but he comes on with a power and a control. And, yes, you think, you know, why are they doing this? Why are they going along with this? Because they're going to believe the, the lie. They're going to believe the camouflage. The smoke screen is so thick if we read further down the Second Thessalonians that said, if it were possible, even the believers would be deceived. And I love that if in there. Because how do you get believers in the tribulation? Sadly, who are you witnessing to right now? Who are you sharing your faith with? If we're raptured today and I believe that we could be, I'm not telling you we will be, because I don't know, and no one knows, but we could be. And if we were, these people that we've been witnessing to that are thinking about it, but not believing it yet, when we disappear, and it just happens to be all of us who have been saying these same things to them, and they knew that we were telling it from the Bible, and we were saying this is what the Bible is saying, and sometimes we can even get to the point in our witness where we warn somebody, if I happen to disappear, this is where you need to read. This is what you're going to need to know. I believe that they are going to say, wow, that was true. I better get saved. I better get right with my God, even if I do have seven years, if I make it, of misery, unless if I get martyred, at least I'm going to save my soul by putting my faith in that God that Rochelle told me about, that, that Maria told me about, that Doris spoke to me about. And they're going to go search the scriptures, and they're going to come to the truth because the Holy Spirit is still at work on the face of the earth. And he knows the hearts that will turn, and he will tug at those hearts, and he will bring them the truth. And I love the fact that God made it so simple. Salvation is so simple. Even a little child 
even and she's out of view, but even Rowena's four-year-old and six-year-old grandchildren who just accepted Jesus this past week, even, yeah, hallelujah, even they can understand it. And as Dr. David Jeremiah said, God put the cookies on the bottom shelf where the kids can get them. <laughs> I love it. Because that fit yeah. in my house. You said, yeah, and, and you, we, not my uh, I think that at the same time is like uh, the, the deceiver, you know. He, he uh, misconstructed the, uh, the word, I would say, or because uh, when, we, when we were saying at the beginning, that a lot of people have this understanding that the day of the Lord is going to be glorious. No. Yeah, they don't think and it's I bad think, till the midpoint. <sighs> exactly, you know, and because I think it's also misconception, uh, not not being in the Word, not hearing, because they are able to hear it, but they are, they're not listening. Right, right. And many are scared, and so they don't want to, I'm not going to read Revelation, I'm not going to look at I don't want to know about it. You know, ignorance does not get you anywhere. It really doesn't. And then there are those who just are complacent, but it's going to be a rude awakening. There are going to be those who are going to be just so scared. Think about it. Think about when we disappear. Have we ever dealt with that? We deal with one person disappearing. It hits the news headlines. So-and-so is 31 years old and they're missing. And there's this whole search for this one person. And you follow it in the news for days. And you pray for that one to be found. Now, blow that up with the rapture. And we all disappear. And we're not going to be found. And they're going to be scared. And they're, they're going to have people who are key in their lives, who are leading and guiding, who are gone. They're going to have chaos in this world. They're going to have this, this, these power grabbers because what happens always is a power grab when there's a vacuum and there will be a vacuum. I hope there's a huge vacuum. I hope there's that many saved. I don't know that there are, but I hope there are. But even in my little corner of the world, God help me, let me be a light so that when this light does disappear, that darkness does scare them and they do get into the word and they do get mm -hmm. saved because I'd rather have them saved and martyred than go into hell later, you know. So, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And they can get saved after the rapture. It's a total lie out of the pit of hell. All of this is Satan's lies to keep people from the truth. That they can't get saved then. Why would God ever say, you can't get saved? Is that my God? For God so loved the world that whosoever. What about the person that just heard the gospel for the first time on, on, let's say, Wednesday, and the rapture happened on Thursday? So they shouldn't be allowed to go to, to get saved because they didn't accept right away. But this other one heard about it for years and got a chance to get saved. Where's the justice in that? God doesn't close off. The day that it's too late is the day they're out of their breath. That's when they're too late, when they can't get saved. You cannot get saved after you've left this earth. Because that's why you got to be ready before you go. Yeah. They can't get saved after what? After they leave this earth. Oh, <coughs> after you die. After you die. You, you don't get a second chance out there. What about those it's people settled. That get baptized for people that are... The people that are baptizing for those who have already gone are just simply getting themselves wet. Sorry, but I'll call it what it is. So, yes. And how many times has your dad been woken up out of sleep, told to go to the hospital? My, uh, we grew up with that, where we'd find out in the morning that, you know, shh, daddy's still sleeping. He was up half the night. God woke him up and sent him to the hospital, somebody who was on their deathbed. And God sent them in to speak to them at the last moments. Gives me hope that that person got saved. Because I think, why would the Lord do that if they weren't going to get saved? <laughs> I hope and I pray. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what about these people like in Revelation says that they're going to be cussing God because of the pain and stuff like that. Right. When do they, when they repent? If they Are repent, they yes, they're forgiven. The same way that that one's forgiven for murder, the thief on the cross was forgiven of, yes. If they repent, even though they were that mad and they cussed out God, God's big enough to deal with that and to say, in your sin you did that. But if they do turn, honestly turn their hearts to God, yes, 
Yes. Okay. The, the only, only thing, thing is when you receive the mark, you're done. When you receive the mark, we're told don't pray for them. They, they, they sealed their fate. That's true. Yes. Let me stand corrected in that. And for those living in the tribulation time who do take the mark, it is all over. They have made their decision. Yes. Um, and they'll never turn back from that, I don't believe, because I don't believe anybody's going to weep and cry and wish they could. No, they've made their decision, and they stay with it. Yeah, yeah. And blasphemy of the Holy Spirit keeps someone from getting saved because, in essence, what they're saying is the power of God is Satan's. Well, if you give that to Satan and you're making Satan your God, then you can't get saved because your God is Satan and Satan doesn't save. So, yeah. Good point. And the yes. blessing of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, is when you don't accept Christ when you die. Isn't that true? It is equal to the blasphemy, yes. Yes. But equating what is God to Satan is called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit also. You know, it's it's making God out of Satan. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We'll come back to Genesis. <laughs> we'll come back to our generations. I'll bring back my whiteboard. We're going to get into a study on the name of Avram and the change of what the significance of, of what it meant. Let me give a tantalizing um, to those of you who are in the other Bible studies that we have during the week. And the question was raised about circumcision. Why when God made a rainbow for a sign, why would he do something so intimate and so personal um, without getting graphic why would he make circumcision this sign we're going to deal with that we're going to answer that better than i think we did in the other study because we're going to get a fuller answer from the hebrew and the depth of meaning that comes into the name change and all of that is very very interesting do i think i've got a handle on it yet no and now i get another week to keep studying <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe I'm getting more insight and more depth and beginning to grasp. But the greater things of God, you know, we'll never fully grasp. That's why, you know, as you grow in your faith, you can look at a verse and see something more and learn something more because it is just, it's just like the child. You can't teach a child algebra until they've gone through addition and subtraction. You know, we have to learn our beginnings, and as we grow, then we can get more. And I'm reaching up, asking the Lord, grow me up, grow me up, give me more, give me more. <laughs> so um, I have some interesting things to bring out on the sign. Why circumcision, especially as intimate and personal as that is. You may get some insight too. Dig on that this week if you want. Um, we will look at the, the change of name definitely because the common answer given I'll tell you right now, there's no room for it in the Hebrew, for it to be that, that to be the reason. In other words, the Hebrew does not say father of many and then father of a multitude. It doesn't fit. I'll give you the whole, but you got to come back, and I'll have to stay on track. <laughs> so um, give me feedback, personal, rather than, you know, with everybody else, but give me feedback yay or nay if today's class was a blessing or if you don't like me getting sidetracked just so I can hopefully judge it better the next time but I truly hope it's been a blessing I think because well, we've I, stayed I, on the word of God right personally I, I I love the idea of that because through the whole Bible you know we we have the Old Testament which is revealing which is showing you know uh, um, Jesus, there, Jesus is there. So if, if, if we only read or we only have the New Testament, we would not be able to comprehend completely why the New Testament is the New Testament. Uh, I so one hundred percent. I love, I love the fact that uh, you know because it, uh, the the Old Testament and the New Testament is yes. one book. I you wholeheartedly know. agree. You know I do. You and know what I'm saying? So, it, we need to have the Old Testament and read and, and study the Old Testament because right here we just can see and just change. I love I, I, that's the way I like it. If I find something that it will be in the, in the New Testament, I love it because it's showing that how uh, important yes. it is for us to read the Old Testament. Yes, yes. We just saw in Shabbat on Saturday how Yeshua reading the portion in, in the synagogue that was for that day 
was reading out of Isaiah and how they knew that it, the connection was there and it told his day and everything. It's quite an amazing prophecy. But if they don't know the original, the old, then they wouldn't get it. You know, and I always think in my mind, it's like the old fashioned clothesline. You've got two poles. You tie a knot in your rope and you carry it through the other end and you tie a knot. And now you can hang your clothes on your line. But if you didn't have a pole on each end with a good knot tied on it, if you just jumped in in the middle and you had somebody hold it up, <laughs> this is going to happen. You know, you're going to lose and, and your laundry is going to get dirty. <laughs> listen, listen. It, 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 it is important. It is important. Yeah. You know, it is, sometimes it blows me away when people say, oh, I don't read the Old Testament. I only read the New. I said, well, then you no. only have half of what you need to know. If even half. Yes. You know, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, you also, getting the sidetrack. Well, today is a very important thing because we yes. are waiting for that event. And, Amen. you know, when That's we start my lesson, we yeah. pray that the Holy Spirit guides us into all Amen. this teaching. Amen. And we just talked about Him. Amen. The right is about the Holy Spirit being taken out, that He's the restrainer. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. don't, don't even worry that, okay. you know. No, I, I, I think you just settled it for me right there because you hit me with the yes. Word of God and our prayer. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, I yeah. love the trend of our discussion. Yeah. Really, I really love the trend of discussion because we are going to the foundation. You cannot just understand the New Testament without connecting it to the Old Testament right. because that is the root and the beginning. Right, and, and sometimes <laughs> we need to so see. The, the, the study be, becomes richer, I yeah. think. I agree. It does for me. It blesses me in that way. And sometimes I think we need to see that hole. We need to stop, step back, get that hole again, okay. and then move forward again. I think it will even enrich our study in Genesis because we've got yeah. that hole. And like you said, Rowena, it is pertinent to our lives. It is what we're dealing with. And when there's so much yes. out there that I hear, I'm not telling you I'm a know-it-all, and I'm not telling you I'm 100% perfect, because I know I'm not. <laughs> but when I hear these person. other teachers <laughs> say these other things, I cringe, and when, especially when they take Israel's scriptures to prove their points. Then I think, you know, if you could just realize God's got a wonderful plan for Israel. <laughs> God's got a wonderful plan for the church. They weren't Amen. replacing Israel. They were a, a different plan that God planned before he created this earth. So it, it's yes. not plan B, and it's not to supersede. It's not to throw out. No. It's just to realize God deals with Israel, and God deals with the church. Does he have kids from both? Yes. He said, I've got sheep from another fold you know not of. And when we are under one house, do we not in the same house have a boy and a girl and call them family? <laughs> Why not you and Gentile and call them family? You know, no middle wall is gone because of Yeshua. But, but that does not mean that you don't deal with a boy as a boy and you deal with a girl as a girl. And the fact that we're trying not to today yes. is why we have the problems that we're having that are coming out of the woodwork at us right now. When you teach a five-year-old, you don't have to be a boy or a girl. You can choose which you are when you want, and it's being taught right now <laughs> in the system. I have heard it, not, well, secondhand from the child, but, you know, firsthand and up front. That's what teacher is saying. Yeah, you're going to have a confused child, and you're going to have issues, and you're going to have problems. But when you are rooted in the Word of God, and you deal with the Word of God, Truth prevails. I am the way, I am the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. So thank you. You've reassured me that when I'm on my sandbox, it's okay, because I know I'm passionate about this. I've tried to contain it in a class. I mean, I could explode for the next several classes. We all know that. Rochelle knows how to run at the mouth. <laughs> but if it's Staying on the word of God and it's blessing you, then I'm okay with it too. Well, thank you, Lord, for worship. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lord, for the for the Lord. Lord. Thank you for His Holy Spirit. You know, thank you for a class that wants to hear Rochelle. <laughs> but again.
can. <laughs> and I even heard myself saying it on Friday night, and I thought, good, Rochelle, say it again and again and again. It doesn't matter what Rochelle says. It matters what the Word of God oh, says. God. So. If you want to believe something, get into the Word of God first. Make sure you can back it up, and then stake your life on it. But don't do it on the basis of anybody else but God. And I know you're all there, but it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder. I have pastors I revere. I have those I like to listen to and I respect. But they all bow their head to the same God that I hold up on top. And he's the one. I've got to see it near from here. They can assist. I can assist. But that's all I can do. And I'm human. So, and I'm open for you to say, hey, what about this? And help me understand that then because, and th there have been times we have made little changes, not about salvation, but about other things that, you know. Um, and honestly, the, the conversation that needs to come out on Calvinism and Arminianism is because those are telling you two different ways for salvation. And it opens the door to some thoughts that are not good. And that's why, again, you need to be grounded in the Word of God. You need to know. And um, the one who brought it to me first is witnessing to someone who is not saved and needs to know how to answer because this person thinks they're saved, and I'm not trying to be the judge, but they're not placing their salvation in Jesus and Jesus alone. That, to me, says, okay, then you're not saved because if it's not in Jesus and Jesus alone, we have a problem. So that's why I brought it to you all. Those who want to hear it, I'll let you know when we're getting, going to air it, yeah. you know, and, and we'll deal with it. But that's why it was important enough. I thought, okay, I'll bring it up because if anybody else is confused on salvation, you know, another thing I'm a, my pet peeve is that you can lose your salvation. No, mm -hmm. you can't. If you can lose it, then you can earn it. If you can't earn it, you can't lose it. <laughs> So you, you know, can lose no. it, it's not eternal. If you can lose it, it's not eternal. Exactly. I mean, there, there are so many little sentences we can say that should just be enough, but I'll give you the whole slew of verses to back it up because nowhere in Scripture does God give you room to believe that you can lose your salvation, and I say hallelujah. But if we're that easy to I, I, be led I, away, that means that we're really not into Christ by heart. You're not grounded in the Word of God. No, exactly. you're into right. man's thoughts and man's teachings mm -hmm. and man's ideas and man's ways. And yeah, I yeah. Somebody I, I, I've heard, I've heard that uh, that it says you cannot lose something that you don't have. That's a good point too. Yes. Of course. Yes, can't lose something exactly. you don't have, and if you have it, you can't. You can't yeah, lose so you can't it. Lose what, no, uh, what did she yeah. say? That she's heard that. Say it again, Maria. I'll say it wrong. That you cannot, you cannot <laughs> you lose what you do not have. What you do you not cannot have lose what you don't have. have. You can't yeah. lose what you don't have. Oh. So if you don't have salvation, you can't lose it because you don't have it. Exactly. You, know, you have to have it to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> Only exactly. in this case, <laughs> having it is all on God. The same way he's going to make these promises to Abraham, you know, it's all on him. You know, salvation is all on God. He is the one who does it all. It's not on us. All we do is open the door and let him in. And he had to do that because he knew we'd blow it otherwise. <laughs> uh, any other comments, questions? Um, okay, I'll close this in prayer, then we'll open up the mics because you might think of something you still mm -hmm. want to say, and I'll make a one-liner real quick just because as soon as I'm done praying, but let's close first. We are so very thankful to our most high God, El Elyon. We're thankful to Yeshua Jesus in the Ruch HaKodesh. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the oh Holy God. Spirit, thank you for leading us, directing us, sealing us in our salvation to the day that we're home with you. Thank you for your word and our time in it today, and please do just bring it to us in such a way we do not forget, and we are solid and secure in your word because you give us no room to worry, fret, or fear. And we thank you that you are the amazing and ineffable and indescribable God who does it all. You save us, you keep us, and you will bring us home. And we say hallelujah. 
not because we've earned or deserved, but because of your great love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're teaching us, even in Genesis, as we start in the beginning, but we find ourselves looking all the way to the end that you've given us to. And we praise and thank you for your whole word to uh, guide, lead, direct, and to be our life, our life saver and our life anchor. Praise you, almighty God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.